There we go. Have to wait till the red light comes on. <laughs> we appreciate the presence of each of you with us today. We, as Boom said, uh, this is a lesson that's going to be somewhat different than what we usually do when we're together like this because if you've gotten a copy of the bulletin, if you read through it, you already have a pre preview of some of the things we're going to talk about. As a result of a variety of things that have taken place in the, in particularly in some of the studies and all that have gone on, it is important for us to recognize several things. One of these things that we have to recognize is that there are a lot of things that we do in a worship service that are purely tradition. There is absolutely nothing in God's word that says that's the way it's to be done. There's nothing there, for instance, that says we have to have a song and a prayer and another song in the Lord's Supper or that we have to have uh, a, uh, any particular sequence of events that take place. We're told that we need to pray, that we need to sing, that we need to teach. And all of these things are things that are there, but God in his understanding has left these things open to us. But there are some additional commands and all that have been given which result in our needing to be confident and assured about how these are to take place in the course of our worship together. In the first Corinthian letter in the 14th chapter and verse 40, Paul stated, everything must be done in a proper and orderly way. And so this is what we want to do in the worship service. And uh, after today, Lord willing, beginning next week, we're going to do some things differently than we did them today and that we will continue to do today. But we need to understand that the changes that we are making, and you're encouraged to look at them from a scriptural standpoint and see what they are. But in the past, there have been a variety of things that have taken place, but we'll gradually work our way into that as we continue on. First of all, some really fundamental stuff. Ch the church. In the standpoint of the Greek language, it's called ekklesia. That's actually two words in Greek. Ek, which is the first two letters of it, is from, and kaleo is call. And the way in which this is translated and understood is, this is the called from the world. So the church is those that have been called from the world. In other words, Christians are those that have come out of the world and they are now in a different relationship with God as a result of the choices that they have made. There are a lot of other scriptures that we could go to today, but I don't have time obviously to deal with all of these, but we need to understand this. But I want you to understand a variety of things. In the Ephesian letter in the fifth chapter of the 23rd verse, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. It is his body, and he is its savior. The church is the body of Christ. So we are the called out. We are also the body of Christ here in this world at this particular time. In, the, in the <clears throat> Matthew, the 18th chapter, and verse 17, if he ignores these witnesses, tell him, it to the community of believers. If he also ignores the community, deal with him as you would a heathen or a tax collector. And this, of course, this particular passage is talking about dealing with individuals within the church that have done things that are contrary to what God would have them to do. The point that we're trying to make from this is the statement that it makes about that this, the church is a community. So the scriptures speak of the church in a variety of different ways. It is those that are called out of the world, it is the body of Christ, it is also a community, a community of believers, a community of individuals that believe in Christ and in doing what he would have us do. But then in addition to this, Paul uses a, another reference here in 2 Corinthians 6. Can Christ agree with the devil? Can a believer share life with an unbeliever? Can God's temple contain false gods? Clearly we are in a temple of the living God. As God said, I will live and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. 
The Lord says, get away from unbelievers, separate yourselves from them, have nothing to do with anything unclean, then I will welcome you. So in this, there's a whole variety of different things that we need to consider. One of the principal facts is that it says to get away from the world. And of course, in everything that we undertake to do, and particularly in what we're going to be talking about today, it is imperative that we look at all the Bible has to say on a subject and not just get microscopic vision or tunnel vision looking at one particular passage of scripture and then trying to formulate everything we believe based on that. This is what is creating the problem in the Christian community today. It's because that's precisely what's happening. People are determining that they're going to use this particular passage of scripture to justify this particular action. Irrespective of the fact that there are other passages that conflict with it, and in fact, even if the context of it teaches something different, we determine that based on this statement, I'm going to believe just that. And so if you took this passage of scripture, you could say you could justify building a monastery and moving out of the world and living in a community all by yourself, which is what some have done. But what is really being spoken about here is, we're talking about that for one thing, that the church is God's temple. Uh, it's the body of Christ. It's a temple. It's where we worship. It's the place where we worship from. Uh, and sometimes it's even referred to as a tabernacle, this body that we have. So there are a lot of different things that are spoken of in the scriptures and that we need to be aware of. But in particular, the fact that we are told here that as Christians, just like we said earlier, the ecclesia, the called out, are those that have come out of the world. And that's what Paul says, come out of the world. In other words, don't be part and parcel with the world. Don't let your actions, the activities you are engaged in and all that, identify you with the world. You're supposed to be separate from that. And this, of course, is precisely what the church has to do. So we are to be distinctive from that particular standpoint. Even Peter referred to it in the King James Version, says we're to be a peculiar people. And sometimes we are kind of peculiar, I guess. But the reality of that, of course, is, is that we are to be different. And Christians are to be different. But we need to understand precisely what we are doing. Then, in addition to that, when we gather together, there are statements that are made in regard to that. Matthew 18, again, this time in verse 20. Where two or three have come together in my name, I am there among them. So, whenever two or three of us get together, the Lord is present. In other words, he makes the time, if you want to call it that, to be with us when we get together to worship him. So, this says a variety of things to us. The one thing, if Jesus cared enough to come, then perhaps we ought to think about being sure we're there too. That's one point that we can make from that. But the reality is, as we look at this, is that we, when we come together in a worship service, when we are assembled together, this is where we are assembled with the Lord and we are involved in a worshiping process. In other words, the assembly that's here is for the purpose of worshiping God. And again, we've talked about this some in the past, but another thing we have to recognize is, is that we are not here to be entertained. And this is another widely misunderstood thing in the community of believers today, is that somehow or other, when you come together as a, as a church, as they called out, that you are supposed to be entertained by what takes place there. That's not the case. We are here to worship God. We are not here to be entertained. What I'm saying is not supposed to make you necessarily feel good or anything like that. My responsibility is to point out to you what God's word says. And so much of the time you hear this kind of thing, well, I go to church to come away feeling good. Well, that's not why you go to church is to feel good. You go there to worship God who is provided with all of the things that you have in this life. And sometimes you can feel good about that. There's nothing wrong with that. But the, re the idea is, is that we are here to worship God. He is the audience, not me, not you. He's the audience. He's the one that's seeing what we are doing. And so 
We are called out of the world for the purpose of worshiping and serving God and doing the things that he would have us to do. Now, we understand when we get together, Bob read it earlier from Acts 20 and verse 7, on Sunday we met to break bread. Paul was discussing scripture with the people since he intended to leave and the next day he kept talking until midnight. So, you know, if, uh, if I want to take this out of context, I have a perfect excuse to keep you here until this afternoon at uh, four or five o'clock because uh, uh, Paul obviously, and the sense they determined the days in those times from sunset, so they began to meet on sunset, which for the Jews was the first day of the week since they didn't have watches and clocks at that particular time. So he started at sunset and he kept on talking until midnight. So see if I run a little bit over, don't get disturbed because I'm just giving you a short time lesson as far as that's concerned. So what we have to be aware of though is the fact that the first day of the week is when we come together. That this is our responsibility. So this nails down the time. First Corinthians 16, two says, every Sunday, each one of you should set aside some of your money and save it. Then money will have to be collected when I come. And this is the basis on which we take a collection is that this too was done on the first day of the week. We don't take a collection on Wednesday night because there's nothing in the scriptures that says you're supposed to take a collection every time you meet. Some do. But the, re the example that we have from the scriptures is, is when they came together on the first day of the week, they took a collection at that time. We try to the best of our ability to stay with what the book says, not what is necessarily the most convenient or the most appealing type of thing or anything of this nature but to try to the best of our ability to do what God wants us to do. And then a passage that should be familiar to most individuals from the 10th chapter of Hebrews, verse 25. We should not stop gathering together with other believers as some of you are doing. Instead, we must continue to encourage each other and even more when we see the day of the Lord coming. So as the Hebrew writer says, we are to encourage each other to be present. So. When we put all of this together, we recognize that there are a group of individuals that have come out of the world, that have made their commitment to the Lord, and that they come together for the purpose of worshiping Him on the first day of the week and do a variety of things in that particular way. We, we take the communion, we give a, our means as we have been blessed. We have all of these things as part of what we undertake to do. And then we could go on to the 12th chapter of the Roman letter, and this is a particularly interesting passage. Brothers and sisters, in view of all we have just shared about God's compassion, I encourage you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, dedicated to God and pleasing to Him. This kind of worship is appropriate to you. In other words, this translates out in a very extended basis, or extended basis, I guess you would say. Worship is intended to be an intelligent use of our mind in order to accomplish the purposes that, G that the Lord would have us to. And so what Paul is telling us here is, as a community of believers in Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility to commit ourselves to doing the things that he would have us to do, to use our intellect, <clears throat> our intellect to understand what we need to do and then undertake to do it. And this means a whole variety of things figure into this. Studying to show yourself approved, doing the things that you need to do day by day, living in a way that makes you independent or separate from the world as far as the actions that you take. A Christian on the job does the best job they can do all the time. Not just as some of the world does, so, well, that's all I'm going to do because that's all I'm paid to do. Well, if that's what it is, uh, if you don't feel like you're being paid right for the job you're doing, then get another job. But the reality is, is that we have a responsibility to be the very best that we can be in whatever we undertake to do, whether we think that we're being treated right or not. That's not under the consideration. The instructions we have are that we are to do the things that need to be done in the way they need to be handled. So as we look at this, we have a variety of understandings here that are necessary about Christians, about worshiping and doing all of these things. 
Now this is where we get into the area where we start talking about some of the changes we're going to make and some of the things about some of the scriptures that are said and some of what's created confusion for some individuals. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, so what does this mean, brothers and sisters? When you gather, each person has a psalm, a doctrine, revelation, another language, or an interpretation. Everything must done to help each other grow. You have to look at the church in Corinth from the standpoint of the whole thing that Paul writes about the church in Corinth. Corinth is a city that is filled with temples that are worshiping all kinds of gods. These Christians have come out of probably some of the most unbelievable backgrounds that you can imagine. They have been, some of them were probably at one time either male or female prostitutes in these temples. They have been taught to eat meat that was offered to these idols as an act of worship. Paul had to deal with that. There are a whole variety of different things that are mixed into the pot here. And as Paul says, you've got everything in the world going on here. Some of you are, are singing, some of you are revealing things, some of you are preaching, some of you are teaching, some of you are talking. You don't have a worship service. All you have is total confusion. That's what Paul's talking about all the way through this. They've got, a, they've got such a hodgepodge of things going on that nobody can understand anything of what's happening. Everybody's doing their own thing. There's a variety of reasons for that. Until this time, particularly for women, they have been nothing more, as far as the world was concerned, as a possession that belonged to a man just like he had a horse or a cow or a hoe, a hoe or a rake or whatever else, she was just a possession. She had no particular rights, though the Roman women, the Roman citizens actually had some rights, but the reality is mostly that women were just basically just, it was just somebody that you had that basically did the housework and did the various things like this and had children. That, that was all you were supposed to do, all it was expected of you. And if you did any more than that, uh, it was unacceptable. So now Christianity comes into the picture. And according to what Christ taught, the woman is now truly the helpmate of a man. She is now his helper. She is now equal with him in the sight of God. The two of them, the two individuals are now one and before God, God sees them both as equals. And so, all of a sudden, the lights go on. They say, oh boy, now I don't have to be quiet anymore. If I want to talk, I can talk. If I want to sing a song, I can sing a song. I can do whatever I want to do because I'm equal to a man now. I, can, I have the right to be and do whatever I want to do. In 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and 34, God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace, as in all the churches of God's holy people. The women must keep silent. They don't have a right to speak. They must take their place as Moses' teachings say. Under the Mosaic system, the women were not mistreated, but by the same token, they didn't have the same freedom that was given to women under the Christian dispensation. We've talked about this before. If we were doing this the way that it was done with the Jews, we'd have a separate room over here and you ladies would all be in there and there would be a barred window there and you would have to sit over there and watch what the men did over here. You would have no conversation, no thought, nothing. You would just be observers to what was going on here. Now that's changed. But Paul says the ladies need to be quiet. Why? They need to be quiet because we don't need anybody singing. We don't need anybody prophesying. And yes, and we're going to get to that too. The women were given the ability to prophesy. That, in other words, we would translate that better as just saying women were given the ability to teach, to speak out, to present the truth. They were given these capabilities by God. So God obviously is not going to say that you have to shut up completely. You can't say anything. I've given you the ability to be able to teach and to speak, but I'm not going to let you use it. 
That would be ridiculous. God wouldn't do that, and we know that. So we have to look, as we said, at the whole situation of the entire Corinthian letter and the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is in turmoil. Paul says we need to do things decently and orderly. In other words, you ladies need to stop talking. Now, all you have to do is think about normal situation. When we get together, think about Wednesday night. Before we can start, what usually happens? A lot of conversation going on. Who's doing most of the talking? Figure it out for yourself. What do you think was happening at Corinth? Same thing. People haven't changed. Still the same routine. So what we're dealing with here, Paul is saying there's a time to be quiet. And Paul did not say here, shut your mouth, don't say a word, I don't want to hear anything from you. He didn't say that. What he's actually saying here is that you are to hold your peace is the literal translation from the Greek. Hold your peace. In other words, hold the noise down. Stop the, stop the chit chat and all of that. We're in a worship service. And at that point, there's no talking. But guess what? This applies to men too. It's not just that the women are not permitted to speak, but in the worship service, the men are not speaking out either. They have roles to play given to them by God since he has been put, the man has been put in the, the <coughs> superior position if you want to call it that, but it's not one that says the woman is inferior, an inferior being to him. It's simply stating that there is a chain of command, if you like that, like the military, in which the man have, bears the primary responsibility and the woman is his helper who assists him in this, in doing the things that need to be done. Now, we're going to have to make some decisions in regard to this. Also, in 1 Timothy 2.11, there's another passage saying the same thing. A woman must learn in silence, in keeping with her position. In other words, the woman has been placed in the secondary position, not because she's inferior, but because everybody can't be first. You can't, everybody can't be at the front of the line, you know, that just doesn't work. Somebody's got to be in the number sec two position. Who was created first? The man. So he's got the first position and the woman is there taken from his side, not to be three steps behind him, but right beside him. But he is in the primary position and God looks to him to have the primary responsibility, which is placed on him. And you can stop and think about this in a whole variety of ways. When I was growing up, who do you think had the most influence and effect on me as far as being taught? My dad who was at work every day and I saw only uh, when he came home from work or my mother that was there with me all day and the one that put the peach switch on me and all of that when I told her I wasn't gonna do what I was supposed to do. Now who do you think had the most influence on me. And who, who to the day she died, never saw me as being more than 13 or 14 years old. So precisely the same thing existed in Corinth. The women were accustomed to being in the positions of responsibility of raising the children, of, of basically assuming most of the things that had to be done every day, and so, they now all of a sudden they have a right to speak out about these things and so they're full of enthusiasm as Christians are. But Paul says you got to throttle it back. You need to be silent. If there's something that you need to learn and you don't, have, you don't interrupt the worship service in order to ask questions about why are you using that passage of scripture, you wait until you can talk to your husband about it and then he's supposed to be the one who let you know what you need to know. But unfortunately, out every woman has a husband. So the question immediately comes on, on the part of some, they say, well, I don't have a husband, what am I gonna do? Well, are there other men in the church? 
does the church have elders? Does it have preachers and teachers? Well, yeah, it does. Well, is there anything in there that says that you can't ask another man a question if you have one about something that comes up in the worship? No. Well, then why not do it? Uh, that's just common sense. But see, here's where the rub comes most of the time. An individual looks at this passage of Scripture and says, I don't have a husband, so I can't ask anybody a question. That's not what it says. The principal point is, is that if there's a question that needs to be asked that takes place about something in the worship service, it needs to take place outside the worship service. You ask the man then, and your husband or whoever, and you get an explanation for it. That's all that Paul's saying. He's not saying that you're a second-class citizen and you need to keep your mouth shut and nobody wants to hear anything you have to say or any suggestions you want to make at any time. He's not saying that. But this is the way many want to interpret it. And I acknowledge that there are preachers and there are men that view it from this standpoint. But that's not what it says. And you have to look at what Paul has to say here. In Acts 18, verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They took him home with them and explained God's way to him more accurately. Now, they're talking about Apollos. Apollos was a preacher. He was, as it says here, that he was a very accomplished one. Uh, he was really good at it. He was a good preacher. He was eloquent, as some scriptures refer to it. But the problem was he didn't understand of the difference between John's baptism and Christ's baptism. So he was teaching the wrong thing. Now, what happens? Here is a man and his wife, Aquila and Priscilla. What is absolutely always the case is that the man always precedes the woman when you're talking about them in this, that particular time and even today for that matter. But in this one instance in the scriptures, it's reversed. Priscilla and Aquila what that says is this. They took Apollos aside and they taught him, but Priscilla did most of the teaching. Now, what does this tell you about, about the woman? Woman can't teach a man. Scriptures say you can't, can't usurp authority over a man, can't teach a man. No. It just, again, you have to understand where this is applied. Because here is an example of a woman teaching a preacher of all things. You know, women can't, surely can't teach preachers. But here's one doing it. So this tells us very clearly and very plainly that a man can be taught by a woman even after he is an adult in the right circumstances. And that's where we need to go. We need to get our minds opened up to the fact where we can see things like this and understand it. In 2 Timothy 1.5, I'm reminded how sincere your faith is, that faith first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. I'm convinced that in your lives also. And, <clears throat> and as you look at this, uh, also look at 2 Timothy 3, the verse that follows that. From infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. They have the power to give you wisdom so that you can be saved through the faith in Christ Jesus. Now, what this says is, is that Timothy's mother and grandmother taught him the Scriptures from the time he was an infant on up. At the best guess, Timothy was probably a teenager by the time uh, Paul found him and, and baptized him and began to use him to help teach. So what, what was the situation? We have a mother and a grandmother who are teaching, obviously, a teenage boy, probably 18 or 19 years old. This question comes up. We don't have this particular problem here, but this problem comes up with some, in that some women say their son becomes a Christian, and so they say, I can't teach my son anymore because he's a Christian now. No, it doesn't say that. Parents have the responsibility to train their children. And so a mother, my mother taught me uh, 
up till she was 97 years old, she was continuing to teach me. Now, I'm a little bit past teenage. So what this would, should communicate to us is the fact that a mother will continue to teach her son, even if he's a Christian, no matter how old he gets. As long as she's alive, she will be a teacher for him. And there's nothing in the scriptures that condemn that. I'm sure that Timothy's mother and grandmother didn't, as soon as he became a Christian, just totally discontinued talking about the Bible or anything else with him. They just backed off completely and had nothing more to do with him. If you believe that, you believe most anything. So these are things that we have to recognize. God, you know, we're supposed to have the least common of all senses, which is common sense, which is what you have to apply to what the Bible has to say too. And instead of trying to distill down the most tightly woven part of some particular passage of scripture and make it so binding that you can't wiggle or even think about what's going on there. That you've got to restrict everything down to the point where there's no imagination left in it. We, we need to get away from that kind of thinking and realize, yes, we need to comply with the scriptures, but we need to look at the whole thing and understand what's really being said. In Acts 2.17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and your daughters will speak what God has revealed. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Guess where that came from? Next verse. Came from the prophet Joel centuries before. After this, I will pour my spirit on everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions identically the same passage of scripture. And so God has always used his people. He has always made it clear that the time would come when he would give the ability to teach not only to men, but to women as well. Now, why is it that, that, that men are the ones who do the preaching? And we'll get to that. But it's not because women are incapable of doing it. And this is another point that needs to be understood, that the way God has this set up is not based on the idea that women are just not capable of doing these things, which is the assumption that many make, is that God is saying that you just don't have the ability to do it. In many instances, it's very possible that there are women that have more ability to do it than the men that are doing it. But God has a particular order in which he wants things done. It doesn't mean that the woman is inferior in any way, shape, form, or fashion. It just means that this is the way God has, has put the situation or placed the, way, the situation so that it has an order to it because God is a God of order. And if there was no order to it, then it wouldn't make any sense, not to him. In 1 Corinthians 14:3. But when a person speaks what God has revealed, he speaks to the people to help them grow, to encourage them and to comfort them. So the purpose of being able to preach, to be able to prophesy or whatever it might be, is for the purpose of helping other people. And women have that capability. Now, when are we in the worship service? And this is the point that we need to talk about and that you need to understand. If we wanted to use the usual terminology that's used in churches, we have a call to worship. That's the song that Boone or Joe or I on occasion lead initially to get everybody to come in and sit down and let you know that we're about to start. That's a call to worship. Then we have announcements. Usually talking about those things that we need to pray about and things of this nature. This is precisely that. Look at the Bible from cover to cover. You will find nowhere in it anything that says that announcements are part of a worship service. They're not. This is just what we do in order to begin. Just like we turn on the lights or turn on the air conditioner. It's part of what we do to have a worship service. But when we open this book, and read the scripture, 
the service begins. We have introduced our worship by the reading of God's word. At that point, the talking stops and the worship service continues. The worship service continues then until we close. Now, the way we've been doing it, the worship service continued through the invitation song that was offered. And at the conclusion of the invitation song, the worship service was finished. In order to make that even clearer about how we're going to do this, there's going to be a couple of changes made. We will continue to have the call to worship and have the announcements made. We're asking that on the announcements now, that if you have someone that you want to be prayed for, please put it on a slip of paper. We have some in the foyer on the table. We want to make more of those available, but please write it down so that we have precisely who it is we're to be praying for because one of the problems, and I have this, I know, so I know it affects Joe and Boone or whoever's making the announcements, is that you call out somebody's name. Well, you know, if I haven't specifically set my mind to remember precisely what you're saying, I'm gonna get the name wrong or else not remember it. So if you want somebody prayed for, the best thing to do is to write that name down. That way we can know about it. And in the event that that doesn't take place, the worship service has started and so at that point in time, there's no way to announce who you want to be prayed for. Take, use one of the visitor's cards if you need to, turn it over on the back if it's one the kids haven't drawn pictures on, and write down who it is you want to have uh, prayed for and put it on there specifically and drop it in the collection plate. We will collect it afterwards because we're gonna make some changes there. And then it can be prayed for because this is the way we're going to proceed. We're going to go into the worship service normally. We'll have all things opening the way we do now. Taking the Lord's Supper, we're going to stop the song in between the collection and the Lord's Supper. We're going to do that. We're going to make the distinction of the statement made that this is a separate part and all of that like many churches do. And we're going to make that separation. Then we're going to go through this worship service at the close of my lesson, I will not offer an invitation. The invitation is a tradition. If you read this, the bulletin, you'll see this was begun sometime back in the restoration movement, some maybe 200 years ago. So this is just a man-made idea. And since people tend to believe that man-made things somehow become scriptural, we want to, we're going to eliminate it. I will close the worship service from here with a prayer. At that point, the worship service will be concluded. <coughs> then there will be announcements made. In the, in the course of the time while the announcements are being made or to be made, we will collect any, off, uh, any requests for prayers that are in the collection plate. We will collect them at that point and then if there are prayers that need to be made, we will have the prayers made at that point in time, along with any additional announcements about when we're going to have the, the fellowship dinner and things like this, that'll take place then. When that is done, we have a prayer for that particular purpose, then there's going to be the option of two ways because the service is over, the worship has ended then we're going to have a situation where either of two things can happen. We will either have, at the discretion of the song leader, we will either have a song and be dismissed, we will have a, a prayer and be dismissed, or we will just be dismissed. Now, that, of course, is going to rattle some people's cage. I recognize that, and that's the reason we're talking about it now. But what we're trying to point out to you is, and to get you to understand is, is that just because traditionally we have done it a particular way doesn't mean that that's the way God said it had to be. That's just the way we decided to do it. And I don't care if you worship with 25 other congregations and they've done